Live Laugh Larceny discusses true petty crimes that may be disturbing to some. Or could be easy listening to all you psychopaths out there. All stories are based on actual events. Eh, but details may vary. Listener discretion is not advised. Welcome to Live Laugh Larceny, the realization that a stool softener isn't a cushy toilet seat. (laughs) This is Trevin. (laughs) And I'm Amanda. So, Trevin, (laughs) it's hard for me to continue on after your intros sometimes, but I'll do my best. (laughs) What's your dreadful dilemma this week? So I've got a dreadful dilemma, and it's hard for me to word this correctly because I don't want to be a person who is just going around and like spreading drama. Ooh, no, do it. Or I love drama. But this <laughs> does have to do with drama. Okay. So I've got a friend and he's been dating a lady uh-huh. for a very long time. And it's not a very healthy relationship. Okay, yeah. And this person keeps trying to drag me into all their problems. Oh, my God. I made it very clear probably seven years ago. Okay. And it wasn't one of those things where it's like, oh, I just kind of gave a little bit of a hint and they won't take it. I straight up was like, do not ever speak to me again, please. I cannot handle you. Straight up. Now, this is where this was your friend that you said this to. This was my friend's lady. Oh, okay. And so it's been off and on with them for years damn yeah so i'm not like gonna say any names i'm not trying to start anything or anything yeah and which you can just tell by the way i'm speaking i don't really feel comfortable about this but this is just such a bizarre thing oh no this girl still won't leave me alone you would think that this was like an ex-girlfriend of mine or something and that she was still like wouldn't let me go but i have multiple phone numbers in my phone belonging or at least of phones that she's borrowed or got new numbers and it all kind of came to a head it's come to a head multiple times i wish people could see my face right now (laughs) i'm like what it's come to a head multiple times but just the other day she sent me a text from a random number which anytime i get a number that's not saved my phone i just assume it's her and she said hey i'm not going anywhere you need to just deal with it and like me And I'm like... So is your friend still with this girl or did they break up? He's still with her. Oh my God. I just didn't reply back because when it's a person like this who's very confrontational, Uh their love language is almost just like saying shitty things. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like not going to say anything. Well, then my phone goes off again. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So then I message my friend and I say, hey, this is happening again. Because it usually happens about once every six months. She just comes out of the blue and is just like... So just because you don't like her. Yeah, I don't like her. And of course, I'm going to tell my friend like, hey, I believe in you. You shouldn't be with this person. Yeah. But the crazy thing is this person is always reading his messages and going through his stuff. all oh, the time. Oh, God. And the weird thing is he's aware of this. He knows this. So I'm like, listen, she's at it again. <laughs> she's bugging me. Oh, my God. And he said, Oh, I don't know why she cares so much to keep doing this. I'm like, I wish you would tell her to stop, but I mean, I know you won't. So then, out of nowhere, my friend, the tone of his messaging starts changing. Oh, God. She's texting you through his phone. So he texts me through Facebook Messenger most Uh of the time. She got on his computer and hijacked it and was just like, Oh, you're pathetic. You're just so obsessed with me. Go ahead and cry. Blah, blah, blah. Pathetic. Blah, blah, blah. And like, just like saying all this like mean shit to me. And I'm like, what in the world, Trevin? This is okay. We just need to have this recorded and out in the world somewhere that if you are murdered, (laughs) look for this person. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) At first, I wasn't going to say anything. And then I finally just said, oh, boy. I was like, oh, here we go. And she's like, oh, he speaks finally she's like saying that i'm obsessed with her and i'm like i'm not obsessed with you i'm trying to go on with my life yeah and not hear from you all the time so then she 
got my attention by just like saying all this mean stuff, putting me down. And then it's just like, I don't know why you don't like me. I've changed. Oh <laughs> my God. I did not see that coming. Yeah. I'm like, can you rewind back or scroll up or whatever and scroll see? up? Like, yeah. And she says, oh, it's just the past. When are you going to let go of the past? It's not the past. You're still, you're freaking me out, man. Like You harass me every <laughs> six months, you psycho. So I humored it for a little bit and I said, look, you really need to get some help. And I'm not, I'm not saying any of this in a mean way. I'm yeah. like, you're both not really helping each other out in a lot of ways. I said, please get yourself together. Yeah. Get some help and go on. <laughs> and then she's like, well, can we be friends, whatever? And I'm like, excuse you? My friend changed his password and got himself kicked off the computer. So then that random number messaged me back again and was just like, please say one more thing and blah, blah, blah. I want to know this. And I said, I'm going to say one more thing and I'm blocking this number. And so I said one thing and then she asked me a question back. So oh I didn't respond God. back. A little bit later, I got a text from another number, okay. a completely different number. Okay. This is getting out of hand. It's super out of hand. So, so then I never responded. So your friend's girlfriend is like stalking and harassing you. <laughs> Just digitally. I don't think that she's actually putting any effort outside of that, but it's still enough to just feel like... Come on, leave me alone. That is really bizarre, Trevin. It's very bizarre. Like I said, it's it's a real drama thing, and I don't like to be a part of drama. I'm not looking for it, but it's yeah. like, this just will not go away. Wow. And it's all because of a conversation that happened seven years ago. A conversation, pretty much. It was basically, it was when I was going through my mentally strained relationship. Yeah. And she was showing very similar signs of what my ex was showing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey, friend, this is probably not good for you. Yeah. And then she started kind of treating me in the same way that my ex was treating me. And I was like, listen, I'm in this place where I'm just like doing all what's good for me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, not going to deal with you anymore. I'm not going to put up with this. Yeah. And ever since then, it was just like, how dare a person say they can't put up with me. And wow. yeah, it's been. She just can't let it go, bro. I hear from her every six months. That is so freaking creepy. I hate it. When good friends are in unhealthy relationships, it's honestly one of my least favorite things. But I can honestly (laughs) say that none of them have ever done that to me. So, my God, that makes it even weirder. Right. I mean, it's one thing if like you've got a friend who's like always falling apart or always upset about something that's going on in their relationship. Yeah. Like, oh, I feel so bad that Susie's boyfriend is always hurting her feelings i wish she would leave that guy but this is a completely different thing when in this situation Susie's boyfriend is constantly dming you or trying to yeah. find ways to talk to you and it's like it's not like we dated or something i've never had an ex that was this into me that is so freaking weird so it's bizarre i wanted to just like put it out there that this is a weird thing and i think it's worth talking about even though yeah. I, I hate I know, I know my friend is a listener and I'm sorry, but... <laughs> oh, so sorry. It's nothing that I would never tell you directly. Yeah, sorry I called your lady a psycho. Eek. I'm sorry I agree, so <laughs> it's fine. Oh my God, Trevin. Well, that is like really freaking <laughs> dreadful. My dreadful dilemma should probably be that I sound like I'm a heavy smoker when I laugh right now. She's sick again. I, I need to make you a theme song. I just know. Play it. Trevin was saying right before we recorded that I've probably been sick on more episodes than healthy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's accurate, but it feels like it is. No, in reality, my dreadful dilemma is that as a lot of you know, I have a four month old baby. Well, she's, she's going to be four months in a few weeks, I guess. So what is she, three months? Three months? Three and a half months? Three and a half months, She's in between. Okay, she's three and a half months. She has now started discovering her hands, which I know that probably sounds funny to you who doesn't have a kid, but this is like an actual phase that they go through where they discover their hands. It's really, honestly, really cute and funny. Mm -hmm. But I was looking at her the other day, and she's just like in complete awe. And I I have a picture, too, so I'm going to post it on our social media. But she's just staring at her hands like, what in the world are these? (laughs) Like, in just such amazement. And I was like, damn, I really wish that I could look at a body part of mine with that much awe and beauty. Yeah. And so it really got me thinking. I was like, okay, it's time for me 
to get myself in order. I want to love my body again. And I was just telling you and Emily before we recorded, I am going to dye part of my hair pink and I'm going to start taking better care of myself and making myself feel good and love my body again. Hell yeah. So it starts out, I guess, kind of dreadful. I guess I'm jealous of my... <laughs> daughter finding her hands i don't know yeah you just want to love one part of yourself as much as she loves oh her my hands god yes i was just like i don't know there's something about it i'll have to show you the picture of it but the way she was looking at herself it was just so cute and i was so <laughs> jealous <laughs> that is pretty cute it's so cute uh, i just don't even know how to explain it but wow both of our dreadful dilemmas were actually kind of personal and slightly serious that's really Never happened before. Yeah. If you're new to our show, they're usually a little more ridiculous than that. But, you know. Yeah. They're usually with a humor twist, which I still think my situation's <laughs> funny, but it's... It's scarily funny, I guess yeah, you could say. Just annoying, but I did it for the show, I guess. Wow. Okay. So we are going to do some trivia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whoa, 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 Trevin, we do not have the rights to say that. Uh, let's have a fun time. And you're first this week? I am totes going first. Oh my god, can't wait. I know you're not the biggest horror movie person. But Absolutely I not. I think our listeners might get more out of this than you. Okay. Are you familiar with Night of the Living Dead? Am I? I don't know. That sounds... Or Dawn of the Dead. George A. Romero, he made... All the zombie movies. Oh, I've seen... What was the parody of that? Was it Shaun of the Dead? Oh, Shaun of the Dead. Yeah, that was kind of based on... Yeah. Was that a parody of that? I've seen that. I don't know if I've seen the original, though. But go go on. Do tell. So he made the first zombie movie. I think it was in 68. I think old school, old stuff. Oh, wow. And pretty much his whole career has been zombie movies. He did Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead... Uh, Night of the Living Dead, Land of the Dead. Damn, there's a lot of dead going around. Yeah. Did he do the movie 128 Days Later? Oh, you mean 28 Days Later? <laughs> <laughs> You're aging it. <laughs> 28 Days Later. Uh, No, that was somebody else. Oh, okay, I've seen that movie and it really scared the shit out of me. That one really was divisive for the zombie people because that was one where zombies were fast and people said it's not real zombies if they're fast oh yeah that's what made it extra terrifying because they were so quick mm -hmm. yeah Ugh, i hated it so it really just kind of depends on when you as a person discovered horror because to some people that's kind of normal and that's people kind of derive off of that when they make more stuff mm -hmm. but there's other people like the purists who are like no night of the living dead they're always slow yeah so i'm going to talk a little bit about george a romero okay george a romero director of such classics as Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead, started his career working where? Mm. Is it A, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, B, Sesame Street, or C, Gilligan's Island? Oh, wow. That's a tough one. Yeah, it sucks that you don't really know much about him, but not that it would really give it away. What was the first one again? Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Oh, okay. For some reason, I don't think that's the one. I'm torn between Sesame Street and Gilligan's Island. Part of me wants to say Sesame Street just because I did a story on it, but I actually used to watch a lot of Gilligan's Island. That's the one I know the most. So I'm going to go with Gilligan's Island. All right. And you wrong. Oh, man. Which one is it? It was actually Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. <laughs> Damn it. That was the one I least expected. <laughs> George Romero directed educational shorts called Picture Picture for Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, most notably a short called How Light Bulbs Are Made. Oh. And he also did the episode Mr. Rogers Gets a Tonsillectomy. Oh my God. Which that sounds odd. That is really odd. Can we find that somewhere and watch that still, I wonder? I bet we could. In certain interviews, George A. Romero said that Mr. Rogers' tonsillectomy was the scariest thing he ever directed. <laughs> but he mainly said it was because he was just so scared of screwing it up, you know, directing like the star of his show on his first thing. Wow. That was straight out of college. And so basically, Damn. Picture Picture was kind of like in Sesame Street where... The, you know, the Muppets have their own thing going on and then it just kind of stops and has like a little video and like, we went yeah. to the zoo today. And yep, it's just, yeah, yep, yep. basically he shot those little things. Oh, but for Mr. Rogers. Okay. 
Damn. See, I never really watched Mr. Rogers, but he seems like a lovely guy. So yeah, I heard a little bit about how he did that. He was friends with a child psychologist. And so he was basically being seen by one and just learning things about children's psychology and then putting it into scripts to try to help kids understand things better and oh. ease them into the real world. So. Love that. I don't know. I think that just from everything I've heard about his show, he really was a good help to the kids that watched the show. So we probably need a little more shows like that nowadays. Yeah, he was super wholesome and he broke a lot of barriers. Yeah. Okay. I also have a trivia for you today. Okay. Have you ever heard of acquired savant syndrome? Acquired savant syndrome. No, I don't think I have. Okay, great. I was hoping that you hadn't, that this is a mystery <laughs> to you. So my question is, what is acquired savant syndrome? If you knew that, this would go by really quickly. Yeah. Okay, so A, instantly perfecting a new skill after a traumatic brain injury. B, slowly beginning to grow a third nipple on the abdominal region. Or C, experiencing a dream, then immediately having the exact same experience in real life. Okay, breaking the word down, mm -hmm. pretty sure it's A. Damn it! <laughs> yes! And I think I have heard about like people who get like a head injury and can play piano or something. Yes, and that is actually the example I was going to tell you about. I probably should have done better, like nipple and dreams. I was going to say, Amanda. whatever B is, I just got that last night. <laughs> You've been slowly growing a nipple on your abdominal region. Yeah, it's been a real problem when I wear tight shirts. Wow, Trevin, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, yes, I have an example of this man named Derek Amato. So, I didn't write down what year this happened. But anyway, when he was a young man, he was swimming with friends and catching a football. You know how you do when you throw the football mm -hmm. and then you jump into the pool after you catch oh, it? Oh, yeah. That's what he was doing with his friends. But when he caught the ball, he accidentally dove into the shallow end, mm. hitting his head. He went to the hospital, but there was no brain bleed, and he was just told to rest by the doctors. Mm -hmm. After a few days, he started seeing black and white squares in his vision. So he said at first, kind of when you get dizzy, you see like little specks kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Except for this was like perfect rectangles of black and white. Like piano keys? Yes. <laughs> and so he didn't know what it was at first. Turns out, without ever having a piano lesson in his life, Trevin, mm -hmm. Derek immediately started playing complex music and is a well-known pianist to this day. Damn. I couldn't imagine what that would be like. Like your head is almost like a computer or something. If you hit it enough times, it might work. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, I think this is another fact that I got from that dang William Shatner show <laughs> that, I, <laughs> that I love. But yeah, it was almost like there's so much about the human brain that we just don't understand. But maybe if we just give it a good whack, mm -hmm. then maybe we can unlock some shit. Do not whack your head at home. Yeah, please do not try this at home. Yeah. Don't dive into the shallow end just because of this. You don't need to learn how to play the piano that badly. That made me think about that girl on TikTok that she does the TikTok videos and she dove into a shallow end at a friend's house and she's like paralyzed. And Oh my God, I haven't heard of that. Yeah. Ooh. I listened to her tell her story and it made me very sad. Oh God, don't do that. Yeah, so change subject quick. I'm sad. Oh my God, I'm terrified. <laughs> please no. <laughs> That's acquired savant syndrome. So if you had a traumatic brain injury, Trevin, and you learned a skill, what would you like to have? <laughs> uh, I would be happy if I could be really good at piano. I mean, I, I'm i not the best at piano. I'm a, I'm a good producer, and that's how I make my music, but yeah. I'm a guitar player. I couldn't put on a concert playing piano. I wish I could. Damn. I, I, it doesn't really cooperate with me the way I want it to. Yeah. Or, you know, just having a super artistic eye and being like a photographer slash like Photoshoppy person. Yeah. Which it's something I've always kind of wanted to do, but 
music and podcasting, I think, takes up so much time. I don't have time yeah. to learn that other skill. Um, I can teach you Photoshop any old time. I, I just, kind of know it very well. I just want to make a lot of movie posters of me and boots and mo- <laughs> of or me and boots and movie posters. I got you. Just tell <laughs> me what you want. I wish that I could immediately learn a new language. I think that would be so cool. That would be cool. Now that I'm older, I do see the fun in learning another language. Yeah. When I was in high school and they're like you have to take one of these classes i was so against it because i was being forced to do it yeah i know i wish i would have paid better attention damn it but i also had a severe alcoholic spanish teacher so he wasn't really that great yeah mine wasn't great either but so are we on to stories trevin wow we've just been chatting up a storm my bad that's okay i love talking to you well, and I'm glad. i've just been trapped inside my house for so long and here i am yeah with children <laughs> Yes, I'm going to tell a story. I'm going first. Okay. And, you know, this actually will kind of tie in with my dreadful dilemma. Ooh. So, you know, it has to do with relationships and maybe ones that aren't positive. Ooh, can't wait. This is my favorite type of story. Yeah, I love when I can tie them together with something else previously. So, here we go. Throughout our lives, we all rack up a lot of things. Knickknacks, socks that seemingly have no match, debt. No matter what we do, it feels unavoidable that we would have these. Random little Christmas gifts bring the knickknacks. Capitalism forces you to have debt if you want to enjoy things others enjoy. And well, I don't honestly have a good explanation for the single sock thing. I'm convinced that I may have drunkenly bought single socks on Amazon one day because there is no way my house is harboring that many lost socks. But I digress. Today, we will be talking about something different from the things I listed before. A thing that we collect more and more of depending on our experiences in life. Today, I will be talking about exes. Unless you're one of those freaks who had a high school sweetheart that you happened to marry, you will have made a few people into exes during your dating life. Some people have many, and some have very few. It all depends on how quickly you wise up to what you don't like. We all have different and very unique relationships with our exes. They can become a good friend, your worst enemy, a stalker that won't let you go, or your biggest object of affection. Maybe if I get this job, she'll come back to me. Unless you're a serial killer, you can't just store your exes away in a box, like you could knickknacks you got for Christmas. Once you let an ex go, they are set free into the wild, forever. From that point on, any time you leave the house, you are tempting fate with the chances of you running into one of these forlorn creatures. You could be out for drinks with friends, and right as you lower your glass with a mouthful of Long Island, there they are, without warning. Your friend turns to you and says, look, it's them. They only call them by a pronoun, because you and your friends both know that person is the Alpha X. Everyone has an Alpha X, An Alpha X is the person who did the most damage, and usually things ended with the most destruction. Most of the time it goes unspoken, because the wake of your bad relationship also spilled into your friends' lives. Like some twisted version of Voldemort, the Alpha X becomes they who should not be named, almost as if speaking their name may summon them from the slimy depths from which they reside. Did somebody say my name? There are a lot of ways to handle an Alpha X. You can block them from every bit of social media and pretend they don't exist. You can continue following them online as if to keep up the appearance that you're the bigger person. Or you can prank phone call them every year on their birthday. No, my crotch does not live here. (laughs) You dick! There's no in between. When I was an adolescent, I went to the house of a man who had been married multiple times. There on his refrigerator was a magnet that read, I miss my ex, 
but my aim is getting better, with a picture of a gun on it. This really stood out to me. To other adults that saw it, they chuckled. But to me, I saw the memory of the Alpha X as a piece of decor for him to accessorize his house with. Obviously, the message of this magnet has really stuck with me. But just like mourning a lost relative, we all handle exes in our own ways. And just like grief, there is no right or wrong way to handle it. Or maybe there is. I don't know. I'll let you be the judge. Brace yourselves, because we are about to dive face first into the strained aftermath of a failed relationship. Wendy was a 52-year-old woman living in Monroe, Michigan. She had a very typical life, a home to maintain, a dog named Cheddar, and one very annoying ex-husband. Hello there. Although he lived in Tennessee and she in Michigan, the fact that he shared the same earth as her affected her ability to enjoy life. There was just no distracting herself from it. She would attempt to peacefully sketch a basket of fruit on her table, but it would always turn into drawings of violent acts, like she was some kind of possessed kid from a 2000s horror movie. Holy shit, Wendy! Even when she tried to relax on the back porch and look at the moon, she would immediately get sick, thinking that maybe, somewhere, he was looking at it too. How could he continue living life without her? She didn't want to be with him. No way. He was the worst man on earth. But he couldn't just exist somewhere else. It became an obsession. Songs would come on the radio that they used to hear together, and it would make her mad. Her favorite restaurant was tainted with the memories of their first kiss. And she couldn't even watch Eclipse from the Twilight series without it making her cry. Whenever she would have a Twilight marathon, she would have to go directly from New Moon to Breaking Dawn Part 1. They just shared too much over Eclipse. I can't take it anymore, she yelled out to herself. In order for me to continue living, Thomas is going to have to stop living. Wendy began to rack her brain on how to get rid of her ex-husband. She considered putting up a sign that read, Cheap Women, with an arrow that pointed into a burning building. He wouldn't be able to resist, she said to herself while rubbing her hands together quite evil-like. But no matter how many plans that she came up with, at the end of the day, she was just a little too lazy. She barely wanted to take the trash out on Mondays. How could she take a life? Just like any American wanting to complete a task, she quickly went to Google to learn everything about it instead of actually doing it. After pages and pages of different keywords and phrases, she came across the answer to all of her prayers. Her eyes were immediately drawn to it, like it was spelled out in bright lights. There, three-fourths of the way down the fourth page of her Google search, was rentahitman.com. She almost spit her nest quick out in excitement. What an ingenious business idea, she thought as she clicked onto the website. Wendy immediately felt comforted and welcomed onto the very sleek website design. Rentahitman.com, your point and click solution, the website's header read. She could not contain how inspired she felt with this new possibility as she continued to read on. The dark web is not safe, but we are. Everyone should know by now that dark and deep webs are not safe places to shop for your nefarious deeds. There are lots of potentially dangerous sites rife with viruses, and fraud runs rampant there. Your privacy is not guaranteed, and your information could be leaked to thousands of less than stellar sites, including law enforcement. And that's no fun. Rent a Hitman is safe, secure, and available right here on the World Wide Web. Our client's confidentiality is important to us, so rest assured that your information will remain private as required under HIPAA, the Hitman Information Privacy and Protection Act of 1964. This all sounded too good to be true, but it's not like she could go asking Yelp about people's experiences with rentahitman.com. Much like laser butt hair removal, people probably don't want to go around bragging about their experiences with the service. 
And if she learned one thing with her daily inspirational quote calendar, it's that if you want to do something new, you're going to have to do something you've never done. Taking this new and exciting leap for a brighter tomorrow, Wendy clicked on the contact button for a free consultation. The service request form was very in-depth. Although it took a little bit of work to come up with some of the answers, Wendy was impressed at how thorough the website was. You really can't be too careful in this line of work, she thought to herself. She signed up using a fake name, but used all of her otherwise correct personal information to be safe. Within a couple of business days, Wendy was contacted by Guido Finelli of the Rent a Hitman Services. You've got mail. Her service request was accepted and she was scheduled for a private consultation with one of their highly trained field operatives. Just like in the movies, the meeting had to be public, so they met at a local diner. Overly eager, Wendy arrived 20 minutes early and got them a table. She sat against the cold turquoise pleather seats and sipped her stale coffee. The air smelt of hash browns and murder. As she began to mess with a hangnail on her left hand, she heard the door open. In walked a tall man with aviator sunglasses and a mustache thicker than a McDonald's triple thick milkshake. You must be Cecilia Saucy Bottom, the man said. Realizing how ridiculous the fake name she gave herself was, she silently nodded and motioned for the man to sit down. The meeting was pretty short and to the point. Not only that, but the man's service was very affordable. For just $5,000, Wendy could sleep soundly, knowing that Thomas was no longer sharing the same moon as her. She gave the man her ex's home and work address, while agreeing that taking care of him at work may be the best decision. All right, I've got everything I need, the man said, as he put his detective-style notebook into his pocket. Let's arrange to meet at a secluded back alley in a couple of hours, where you can give me the down payment of $200, and then we can say bye-bye to your ex-husband. Wendy was so excited and hopeful that she didn't even drive the extra couple of blocks to save transaction fees on her official bank ATM. She went to the nearest one and paid the additional $2. She was that excited. A couple of hours passed as Wendy found the man leaning against a back alley brick wall. Psst, you got the money? The man asked inconspicuously. I sure do, said Wendy, handing over her manila envelope full of cash. And you're sure you want to do this? Asked the man. Once you do this, there's no going back. Wendy gave the same approving nod she gave when she was answering to the name Cecilia Saucybottom. As she turned to walk away, the man said one more thing. Well then, I guess you're under arrest. In July of 2020, Michigan woman Wendy Lynn Wayne sought out a way to rid herself of her ex-husband once and for all. Stumbling upon the website rentahitman.com, she signed up to have an operative take care of her problem. Little did she know, Rent a Hitman was created by a man named Bob Inez, who made the website as a funny test website for a class project. Checking closely at the request, Bob surmised that this was, indeed, a serious request. Bob turned the request over to the Monroe Police Department as they sent one of their own undercover as an operative for rentahitman.com to complete the deal and arrest Wendy. The Monroe Circuit Judge Daniel White was quoted in saying, Nobody looking at it could have believed this website was real. But you did, and this didn't pop up on your Facebook feed. You went looking for it. Wendy was sentenced to state prison for a length of 7 to 20 years for one count of solicitation of murder and illegal use of a computer to facilitate a crime. The story of Bob Inez's Rent-A-Hitman website is also quite interesting. As it was created in 2005 for a class, he originally left it sitting for three years without checking on it. When he finally did get back to it, the site had between 250 to 300 requests in its inbox, asking for asset extractions. The site has reportedly prevented more than 100 crimes by reporting requests of shootings, 
kidnappings and murders. Let this story be a lesson to all of you when looking to deal with an alpha X. Please know that murder is never the answer. Luckily, I can make this a live laugh larceny story because of its petty nature and not because of the extent of the crime. The punishment and crime is far beyond petty as far as the law goes. But if Wendy would have succeeded in actually getting a hitman from rentahitman.com, you would have been hearing the story on a more reputable murder podcast, like Sinisterhood or My Favorite Murder. To see that Bob could make such a funny website into a crime-stopping force to be reckoned with really gives me some hope for my show. Who knows? Maybe Amanda and I will accidentally stumble upon solving a crime with one of our dumb petty crime stories one day. Maybe my childhood dreams of one day being a crime-fighting superhero aren't lost just yet. As long as I have my trusty microphone with me, I could start taking down bad guys, one dick joke at a time. Holy shit, is this website still active? Yep, I was actually looking at it. That whole quote in the middle section was the whole, like, what do you call that? Like the business description, the sales pitch. Oh my God. So is it like really shittily put together? Does it look like a project website? It looks like a parody website. Okay. Okay. So it's not poorly made, but it definitely looks like a joke. Wow. The guy says his name's Guido. There's fake reviews that go through and some of the reviews are just kind of silly, but yeah, like it's kind of like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It's like, oh, for extractions or... Uh, wow. Do you get flagged, though, for going to it? I don't think so. <laughs> Are they coming for you, Trevin? <laughs> I, I clicked on the free consultation button just because I wanted to see what the thing you fill out looked like, which yeah. has a lot of information, which, I mean, if he really is just giving that stuff to the police, you give a lot of information because you have to put like your number your home address and it says your home address but it says just for operative information or something like that to make you feel safe giving it and then you have to give the target's home address and the target's work damn (laughs) it's pretty funny whoa so my mind is just blown so this guy is just trying to have some fun Mm -hmm. and he has stopped how many murders did you say it said that he had stopped at least 100 crimes holy shit because that that is wild out of the 250 to 300 that were there when he first came back to it there was probably a lot of jokes in there yeah but apparently 100 of them were actually all pretty serious do people really think it is that easy to get a hitman this lady does not look smart to me okay she looks to (laughs) me as i don't want to generalize dumb country person (laughs) Hey, we were raised around them, so we know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm one of those dumb country people. But it seems like maybe an older person who doesn't fully understand the internet too well okay. would think that a www dot website might have that. Now we all know that if you really want a hitman, you go to the dark web and you find them that way. <laughs> but I guess they just think that oh, you never know what's creeping on Google. I mean, when I was a kid. I would try to show my family a website or something and I would be like, hey, mom, look at this. And it would say something about like, oh, just for five ninety nine, you can get this. And my mom's like, do they have our money? You didn't give them the money, did you? This was before I was even old enough to have a credit card. It's like, I didn't <laughs> slip a five into the disk drive, mom. Like, come right. on, lady. Right, right, right. So I think there is a disconnect with people who weren't raised around computers don't really know what yeah. is and isn't. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Wow. Stories like this just never get old and they never (laughs) cease to surprise. (laughs) Yeah, I love people's fails. Man, have you heard of, it's a pretty notorious cops episode where a woman thought she was hiring a hitman and it was an undercover cops and they recorded the whole thing Mm -mm. and they even pretended the hit went through and they recorded her coming home and they put caution tape around their apartment and everything. It's like a huge deal. But they like told the guy that the boyfriend was in on it and then they like take her to the police station. Like they know that he's not really dead. But she doesn't. And then they have the boyfriend come in as they're questioning her. (laughs) It's honestly one of the most dramatic and like reality TV episodes of Cops ever. 
And she actually was in court back and forth for years and years and years because her defense team was saying it was all for the cop show and it wasn't real. Mm. You haven't heard of that? Oh, my God. You have to watch it after the story. Oh, my God. That's the thing is that's funny and that's great television. But the bad thing about the police doing that for good television is it does give her that defense of like, I knew it was a joke the whole time. Yep. I was just making good television. Yep. Yep. Which is why that will probably never happen again. Exactly. Yeah. No, I think it was a big learning experience for everybody. Like, yeah, that made great TV, but look at the shit show it caused Mm -hmm. legally for them. I don't even know. I think she was on house arrest for like years and years. I don't know if she actually, I think she may have gotten in trouble finally, Mm -hmm. but it took so long. Yeah. I think they've cracked down on attempting to hire a hitman. I think it's gotten worse over the years. Yeah. Some, somebody must have, you know, got butthurt about it or something. I don't know. Damn. And also, is the Alpha X something you made up? Or <laughs> yeah, is this I, like a common phrase that I've never heard? I made it up. Okay. You know, though, I really think we all have at least one of those. Yeah. I mean, feel free to let this catch on. I mean, I find it to be very relatable. And I'm sure yeah. when I was saying it, you pictured that person. I did. Damn. I, I just assumed assumed it was a well-known thing that everyone said mm-hmm. and I just was out of the loop so that's really funny that that's like your thing it could be a thing that other people said I didn't take it from anywhere wow um, it could be the on alpha x what, what is that called whatever dictionary.com uh oh urban dictionary yeah I mean it could be on like urban dictionary.com oh, maybe but that'd I, be cool. I came up look. with it at least on my own okay you <laughs> need to patent that shit real quick copyright yeah <laughs> we'll make alpha x dictionary shirts <laughs> Oh, my God. Well, stay away from your Alpha X and don't hire a hitman online. Noted. Yeah. That was so well done. Great job. Thank you. Whew. And the majority of that was true then. It didn't really sound like you had to fluff that really up too much, huh? No. The only thing I fluffed up was I don't know if they met at a diner. I know that they met publicly and then they okay. left to come back for a down payment because the joke was... $200 down payment was for travel because the guy was in Tennessee. So the guy was like, I need $200 down payment to go. So okay. I didn't do that. And I guess the woman also had said that she felt that her husband had like swindled her out of $20,000 or something. I don't know if that was like an alimony thing or what. Okay. It was very vague. But at one point she had said he took money from me. And in court, she did completely fess up to it and say she tried to get pity on the stand because she had said like oh i just had to deal with a uh a relative that died a little bit ago so i've just not really been in the right headspace so i really apologize for what i did but i totally did do it and then the jury was like okay you're still guilty yeah they're like okay we all have gone through that we're not just all going to rentahitman.com yeah but yeah definitely not much fluffing i just wanted to paint a more vivid picture on how she met him well and who knows if they really had you know their twilight series moments together (laughs) I'm oh, yeah. sure that was an additive, but I loved it. Yeah, I felt we all needed to just think about that epic film series. Yeah, oh yeah. I hadn't thought about it in quite some time, <laughs> so thank you very much. Okay, so I have a story that I will tell you all today, and it isn't from the news, but it also isn't a personal story, and technically it isn't even a listener story, Because my husband does not listen to the podcast, (laughs) except for when he has to listen to me making like our clips or whatever. (laughs) Yeah. And he better like it. He better like every second of it. But I do have a husband. uh, I do have a husband. Well, congratulations. (laughs) (laughs) I do have a story from my husband, Jordan, and he's decided to not be anonymous because... As much of a rebel as he is, and as much as we've talked about him being kind of wild and whatever, especially in his youth, he's the victim in this story. Oh, poor guy. And with all of that, here we go. What do petty crimes and tattoos have in common? Well, as it turns out, there are many similarities. Both can be motivated by love, a dare, or even boredom. Being under the influence of drugs or alcohol increases the chances of beginning either activity. And ultimately, both can cause pain, especially when the outcome isn't what you expected. Nice dick tattoo. 
It's supposed to be a happy elephant. You would assume that tattoos and petty crimes must be planned out in great detail and with care. But if that were the case, we wouldn't have nearly the amount of crime stories to tell on our show. So for those of you with tattoos of your ex's name, or a tatted pair of praying hands with extra fingers, listen up. I don't want you to make any more mistakes than you already have. And I certainly don't want you to experience something similar to the story I'll be telling you today. Jordan was three days out of high school when he decided he might as well join the army. It's not like he had any summer plans, and he didn't look bad in military green, so away to basic training he went. It was a time filled with yelling drill sergeants, Stand straight, maggot. uncomfortable shared showers, oh, what lotion do you use? and running. Lots of running. It reminded Jordan of being back at home, only with better food. After basic training was done, it was time for Jordan to go to AIT. You see, AIT is the thing that you go and do after basic training. Also, it's a little more chill. This meant that after being there for a while, Jordan could get day passes where he could leave base and do something he actually wanted to do. Let's go to Walmart and buy a bunch of puzzles. The only problem was that Jordan didn't want to wait for one of those passes. Even though he had conformed enough to join the army, he was still a bit of a rebel. Jordan had been at AIT for a month already and had just gotten into an argument with his toxic girlfriend back home. He figured it was time to get another tattoo. At this point, he already had a menacing joker on his ribcage. He thought maybe his next tattoo would go in a less painful place. But then he thought, screw it, let's go for the collarbones. He wanted cursive writing in the quote, After everything I've been through, I still rise. Jordan couldn't remember where he heard the quote, Google or Oprah, but he liked it regardless. One fall afternoon, Jordan and another army friend walked off base, got into a cab, and were off to the closest tattoo shop without their day passes. Although he wasn't from this area of the U.S., the shop appeared to be legit. Recently, his other army friend, numbskull Fred, got cheetah paw prints going up his leg, and it turned out okay. Meow. The two guys excitedly walked inside, ready to get some new skin art. Jordan's tattooer was an average-sized man, with short blonde hair and contrasting tattoos against his pale skin. He was a jittery fella, who was having a hard time sitting still. Making eye contact with the tattoo artist, Jordan was a little worried about the man's dilated and bloodshot eyes but he figured he was already in too deep. Plus, he wasn't leaving without a tattoo. As Jordan followed the tattooer into his room, he noticed the man pulling out a pistol from his waistband. He then opened a drawer where Jordan saw another pistol, brass knuckles, and a buck knife. Whoa, good thing I'm not here to rob this guy, Jordan thought to himself. Although this odd man was a complete stranger to Jordan, he was ready and willing to let him needle into his flesh. He leaned all the way back in the shop's chair and tried to relax. That is when the familiar sound of the tattoo gun began to rattle. As the tattoo artist scratched his needles into Jordan's chest, the two began to have some simple conversation back and forth. So, man, the tattooer began, What's your name? My name is Jordan, Jordan shouted over the tattoo gun. The tattoo artist looked stunned (gasps) as he replied, No way, man! My name is Jordan! As he pointed at his tattoo license framed on the nearest wall. The men both laughed, and the tattoo artist followed up with, How old are you, my man? I'm 18, Jordan admitted. The tattooer shook his head as he reminisced. Aw, man, I would do anything to be 18 again. The conversation continued normally until about 20 minutes had passed. That is when the conversation took an eerie turn. 
So, man, the tattooer began, what's your name? Jordan paused, unsure of what he had just heard. My name is Jordan, he replied with a slight confusion in his voice. The tattoo artist looked stunned as he replied, No way, man, my name is Jordan. And he again pointed at his tattoo license framed on the nearest wall. Jordan tried to remain calm as he tried to reassure himself that possibly the tattoo artist simply forgot that they shared the same name. That is until the tattooer continued by repeating the question, How old are you, my man? I'm 18, Jordan stated, now realizing that this wasn't just one case of the forgetfuls. The tattooer shook his head as he reminisced. Aw man, I would do anything to be 18 again. There was an awkward pause of nothing but the tattoo gun. As Jordan tried to change the subject, So, uh, do you eat food? It was a very strange encounter, but he did his best to let it go. Some time had passed, and Jordan's tattoo was now more than halfway done. He had almost put the bizarre deja vu conversation from his mind when the tattoo artist asked, So, man, what's your name? Oh, God, Jordan thought. He reflected back on the artist's jittery behavior and the drawer full of weapons. Was this dude okay? My name is Jordan, Jordan said now for the third time. The tattoo artist looked stunned as he replied, No way, man, my name is Jordan. And he pointed to the same tattoo license framed on the nearest wall. Jordan wondered if he was on a hidden reality TV show as he nervously scanned the room for cameras. Hmm. But he was interrupted by another question. How old are you, my man? Fuck, no cameras were in sight. This guy had to be high as a kite as he tattooed permanent ink into his skin. I'm 18, Jordan said in defeat and clenched his butt cheeks in fear. The tattooer shook his head as he reminisced. Aw, man, I would do anything to be 18 again. Finally, after an hour and three duplicate conversations, Jordan's tattoo was done. He couldn't believe what had just happened and gulped as he lifted himself from the drugged-up tattoo artist's chair. Jordan made his way slowly towards the mirror, right next to the O2 familiar tattooing license on the wall. He squinted his eyes as if he was watching the climax of a horror movie, and he looked to see what damage had been done. To his great surprise, the tattoo was good. In the end, Jordan wasn't sure what illegal substance his tattoo artist, Jordan, was on. And who knew how many illegal weapons were in that tattoo shop? But he had somehow survived the experience with a decent tattoo and a hell of a story. No charges were ever pressed, and he even went back to the same tattoo shop later on for a touch-up. The moral of this story should be clear. Don't be like Jordan. Don't be like Jordan. Don't be like Jordan. Because both petty crimes and tattoos can leave a permanent mark on your life. And you should always think before you ink. Which Jordan should I not be like exactly? <laughs> I don't... Either one, Trevin. Either one. Okay, I don't think I like what either of those guys did there. <laughs> I would have ran away from that crazy guy. Dude, honestly, I think a lot of people probably would have ran mm-hmm. or at least said something or did something or made an excuse to not make it awkward to get out of there somehow. Mm-hmm. But... My Jordan, <laughs> not talking about the tattoo artist, that's just kind of his personality type, you know? Yeah, he he's just kind of He just kind of rolls with the punches of life and almost to a fault, though, yeah. as you can tell. But, you know, he's kind of just like, eh, whatever happens, happens kind of guy, which I find to be quite interesting <laughs> as, as his partner sometimes. But yes, this is all a 100% true story. Wow. I was listening to this thinking I was listening to like Twilight Zone or something. 
because I was thinking, okay, the dude's going to start short circuiting and smoke's going to blow out of his <laughs> ears or something. I know. I even asked him, I was like, okay, before I tell your story on my show, are you sure that this man didn't have like short term memory loss or yeah. something? Because I was like, that wouldn't be a crime. Now, being high as a kite with illegal weapons while tattooing you would be, mm-hmm. obviously. I don't even know like what the charge would be, though. Like, what if Jordan would have somehow went to the police station afterwards and they found out he was really high while tattooing? Like, what would the charge be? Just like a drug charge? I guess. I tattooing think have, under the influence? <laughs> I think they'd have to have more of a reason to even go in there and do that. I know, I know. But it has to be illegal in some way, right? Oh, like, I'm sure it's illegal. Because you can't even be the one getting a tattoo. Like, they'll ask you, are you under the influence of drugs and alcohol? Which, obviously, people are a lot of the times. Mm. But they have to, like, legally ask you that. So, God, it should be clearly clear as day a rule for the tattoo artist not to do that right but he was like no 100 percent. the guy was like going through a weird trip or something he was Mm -hmm. on something like i could tell it in his behavior and in his eyes i even asked him i was like were you like freaking out thinking he was forgetting what he was doing on your body that's what i was thinking and but he's like no he put a stencil down first so he was basically just tracing the stencil yeah and he's like the first time it happened i thought maybe this guy's just stressed out maybe he's had a hard day maybe he hasn't slept but the third time really concerned me yeah with like the same response each time yeah and he said each time he said it he was like beaming with pride and like pointing to his license (laughs) like i got my tattoo license and my name's jordan He said it was so eerie that every single time he did it, he had the exact same inflection in his voice Mm. and emotion and everything. I'm kind of jealous of that, though. I would just go watch (laughs) one of my favorite movies again and be like, it's so good. How did I know I was going to love it? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. Because, yeah, I was like, this guy has short term memory loss or something. But Mm -hmm. he said that every other thing, like the transaction of payments and like going over the design and everything else, he didn't repeat. But like as he was tattooing, he could tell like something was going on with this guy. Maybe he's like one of those people and he just kind of goes in a trance and he's like in work mode to where only one part of his brain works to do a great job tattooing. (laughs) I don't know. And then the part at the end of the story, he went back and got a touch up. That surprised me. And I looked at him and I was like, are you freaking kidding me? And he's like, oh, I didn't think I was going to get the same guy, but I did. I ended up getting Jordan again. And I was like, did he ask you your name and the whole thing again? And he's like, nope. He's He totally acted completely normal that time. Huh. But he didn't remember Jordan at all. That's weird. Yeah, that's why there's a lot of things leading to him being high as a kite. Right. <laughs> also, I will say... My boy Fred's sitting here next to me, and yeah. he heard Numbskull Fred, and I think that offended him a little oh, bit. Oh, I'm so, so sorry, Fred. When I came up with that character, it had nothing to do with you. You know you're my fave. So the connection is that, and I actually talked about it twice. I thought I had only brought it up once in this story, but I talked about getting your ex's name tattooed on you and how he had been in a toxic relationship, causing him to want to get the tattoo And your story had to do with obviously some toxic exes and relationships as well. Yeah, what a fun theme. (laughs) What a fun theme, yeah. What a fun theme. Toxic exes. Gotta love them. Oh, that's so great. I'm so glad that that was the theme that it went into. All my exes live in prison. We should do a remix. We could try it. I mean, I don't think any of my exes are actually in prison, but I mean, there's still time. (laughs) Yeah. If you have any exes in Texas, we'll be down there in a couple weeks. Oh, God. I hope not. (laughs) Stay away. Yeah. Well, what a great time, everybody. I hope everyone's having a great week. Hopefully the next time you hear me, I won't be sick anymore. Fingers crossed. I can only hope at this point. But just remember, no matter the crime, big or small... In the end, we're all doomed. Doomed and doing stuff bad with exes. (laughs) Don't make me do my smokers laugh, Trevin. I can't. I can't handle it. Bye. See ya. Thanks for turning off Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and turning into our show. 
Take a break from hate following all your exes to love follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Live Laugh Larceny. And if you have just discovered your own hands, use them to send us your petty crime stories to live laugh larceny at gmail.com. Or you can find us on social media. And if you have as many fake profiles as my bizarre stalker has phone numbers, use every single one of them to give us five stars on Apple, Spotify, or Good Pods. Doomed and doing stuff bad with exes. <laughs> Don't make me do my smokers laugh, Trevin. I can't. I can't handle it. Bye. See ya. <laughs> I hid from you. That was so. I was like, oh my god, no. It was cringy. And it was so cringy.